Hello, welcome. We've got a really nice challenge problem here that I think gives us a view into how different geometry and algebraic approaches to a problem can be. So I like this problem because it's, it's interesting both algebraically and geometrically, and I'll show you what I mean in a moment, but also reminds me that uh, the strategy you pick to solve a problem really impacts the way you think about it. So for example, with this problem, when I first saw it, I, I felt like I was looking at it algebraically. I was trying to think about uh, the vertices of an equilateral triangle and angles and distances on a coordinate plane. Um, and I was really only focused on algebra. But then when I went to the geometry of it, it felt a lot more accessible. And in fact, what's really cool about this problem is that it's not so much that geometry uh, makes this problem easier or harder. It's that the geometry for me gives me insight into the algebra and the algebra as you'll see as we solve it gives me insight into the geometry they really inform each other and in terms of problem solving really you want to think about what way am i looking at this problem uh, if you're getting stuck from one perspective switch go to another so let's let's just take this problem let's read it together um, in fact you might pause the video right now and try it on your own and then press play when you're ready to solve it with me Okay, so you had a chance to think about it. I'm noticing we've got an equilateral triangle, okay, and we're given two of the vertices of that triangle, E and Q. So remember, I'm thinking, okay, what do I know about equilateral triangles? That means a triangle where every side length is the same. So maybe there's something here about distance formula. And I'm thinking I've got two of the points already. They want us to find all possible coordinates of the remaining vertex. So there, that tells me there could be more than one answer. And I'm going to jump over to, let's see here, GeoGebra. And um, I'm going to basically use this to think about the problem. So I'm going to retype those points. I think it was E was at 2, 1. OK, there's E. And then Q, I believe, is at 6, 5 or 5, 6. Oh, no, I'm going to remember. It's 6, 5. I've got to go back and check. Let me see. 6, 5. OK, cool. So I've got these two points. And I'm thinking this is a segment on an equilateral triangle. OK, so let me just connect those. I go to my tools. And I'll select a segment here. Let me drag this over. Lots of different things I could do. Here's our segment tool. And I just click from one to the other. All right, so that's segment F. That's one side of my equilateral triangle. So I'm thinking there's got to be a point. Go back to the algebra. And it's got to be, let's see, estimated somewhere over here, right? Or on the other side, so I'm thinking there's more than one answer over here. Because wherever I put that point, it has to be the same distance from where I am to Q and to E, right? It has to be equidistant. And over here, whatever point I pick, it has to be the distance from that point to Q and E has to be the same because it's an equilateral triangle. So with equal distances, I'm thinking I want a circle. All right, circle's got an equal distance everywhere from a point. So I'm going to choose from point to point. Center it at E. Oh, it's mad at me right now. Hold on, let me, let me just type it in. Sorry, E to Q. That tells me the center is at E of the circle, and it's going to point Q. There we go. All right, what does that tell me? It tells me every possible point, whoa, <laughs> every possible point on this circle is the same distance from E right? That Q is from E, right? This is the radius of the circle E to Q. So anywhere I go in the circle, I'm the same distance from E. So my answers have to be somewhere on this circle. But another circle, if I do the opposite, if I um, make my circle center at Q and then I go from Q to E, now I've got a collection of all the points that are equidistant from both E and Q and are the same distance from E to Q. Notice that they, those two circles cross at these locations, and those are the answers to my problem. Wow. So let me get the intersection there. Intersect. And here's intersect. And I want to intersect two circles in this case. My circles are named C and D. You can see that there, C, lowercase c, lowercase d. And it just click, gave me these two points, A and B. So I can then draw my triangle, which is a polygon. And I'm going to give it a list of points. So click here. And I'll do from A, E, Q. That's my first set of points, A to E to Q. And then let's do another circle, oh, not circle, polygon from the other point. And OK, that's from B, let's say B to Q to E or something like that. B to Q to E. 
or maybe I'll just keep the order the same, BEQ. All right, so I want to distinguish these two triangles. I'm just going to change the color there in this triangle. Style, no, color. Most of my students seem to want pink. And I keep doing that. I keep selecting just the segment. No, I don't want just the segment. I want the whole triangle. Let's scroll up and look for that polygon. Here it is. This polygon, let's change the color. Color. All right, go for that one. All right, so I actually chose the second polygon. The first, <laughs> the first polygon I made, T1, but if I scroll down, there's T2, there's the other polygon. I just want to see the differences between them. Okay, so this is great. I, I feel like I love the geometry of this. It, it reminds me that I can find the location of the points using circles, preserving the equal distance. Uh, and now I'm thinking, well, where are these points exactly? Because if I, if I look at the solutions, here they are, the intersections right here. You might not be able to see, but there's these long decimal points. So about 0 0.53, 0 0.46 for A, and then about 7.46 and negative 0.46 for, for B. And I, I should have maybe said for A, 0.54, round to the nearest hundredth. But where where's that coming from? Well, I'm thinking that if I look at this, don't want to move that around. Because it's so cool and joke. You can move the construction around. Um, so we get back to its original location. Anyway. Uh, don't get distracted, Sean. Okay, focus. So here, I'm thinking that I have this line EQ, and if I knew the slope of this line, I could then find the perpendicular slope of it to find A. Somehow, right, the slope of the line that goes through A, and I'd say the midpoint of EQ, has to have a negative reciprocal slope or a perpendicular slope to EQ. So A to, let's say, M, the midpoint, has to have a negative reciprocal slope to e to q, and the same is true over here on the other side. But I need to stop moving it around. Let me zoom out just a tiny bit, and maybe right there. And I'll take a screenshot of this, and I'll do the algebra right on top of that screenshot. So here's the screenshot. Go back here, okay. All right, so I wanna reduce that in size. It's taking up too much of my screen. And I, this is, okay, so the first, what just happened was we use geometry to find the points, right? And that's helping me make a plan for my algebra. And now we're going to use the algebra to figure out exactly where those points are. And I think that's really neat. So let's get to, let's get to it. First of all, I want to find the midpoint of, let's say, EQ. So the midpoint of EQ, the segment EQ. That's going to be the average of the x values. So 2 for E, 6 for Q. 2 plus 6 is 8 divide it by 2, and then the y values are going to be 1 for e and 5 for q. So 1 plus 5 is 6, divide that by 2. All right, looking good. This point, the midpoint of eq, is 8 divided by 2, 4, and then a height of 3. That's this point right here. We'll say that's 4, 3. And I'm going to call that point m. Now, I, I want to connect, um, connect that point to this vertex here, a. So I'm just going to get my line tool and just, because you would have a, maybe a ruler to do that. I'm trying to find the slope of this line right there. And I know that that line would have to be perpendicular to this one here as well, because I'm drawing a perpendicular bisector. So I want to find the slope of e to q. So the slope of e to q of that line. Now slope is just rise over run. It's how much you're moving up. So it's for e, it's I'm going up from 1 to 5 for q. So 5 minus 1 is 4. And then I'm going over from 2 to 6, and, and 6 minus 2 is also 4. The slope of EQ is therefore 1. So the perpendicular slope to EQ, what does that have to equal? It has to be the negative reciprocal, and that's negative 1. Negative reciprocal is just multiply a negative 1. So, these, so if I have 1 for 1 slope, I multiply that by negative 1. Uh, that'll get me negative 1. They've got to be negative reciprocals to each other. And you can see uh, a little bit about why that makes sense, right? This slope is going down 1 over 1, whereas this slope is going up 1 over 1 over here. Those do seem to give you a nice picture of perpendicular lines, which it does. All right, so the perpendicular slope to EQ is the one we need. That's the slope of AM. So I'm going to write the slope of AM. That does equal negative 1. Let's put this together. On this line right here, it crosses the point 4, 3, and it has a slope of negative 1. So let's use point slope form. y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And we just plug in, right? 
we know our points. Here's our x1, 4, and our y1, 3. So x minus 4 times the slope of this line, negative 1, has to equal y minus this y value, 3. Now, I could leave it like this, but I'm going to just rewrite it. So it says y equals negative, I'm going to distribute the 1, negative 1 times x is negative x, negative 1 times negative 4 is positive 4, and then add the 3 over. So that means y is equal to negative x plus 4 plus 3, which is plus 7. Now this, I feel like this equation, even if I don't know what I want to do entirely, it's got to be helpful. This equation describes this line right here. And that's one restriction. Like the point A and B have to be on this line, and I can just extend it to see that it would eventually reach B, right? It would get down here eventually. So it has to be somewhere on the same line. The other restriction is that the distance from Q to A and the distance from Q to B have to be the same. And likewise, the distance from E to A and the distance from E to B has, has to also be the same. Now, what's interesting about that I think I can maybe animate this. Can I? No. Um, all the points that are equidistant f uh, from Q and reach A form a circle. And that's the circle we were drawing here. This circle, if I, I'm trying to extend it. If I just keep drawing this circle, I get other points that are the same distance from Q, right? This thing. So think about that for a second, badly drawn circle. The point A and B have to be somewhere on this circle because they have to be the same distance from Q that E is, right? E is the square root of 32 away from Q. We'll prove that in a moment. These have to be that same distance. They're on the same circle. So let's verify this. What is the distance, D for distance, from E to Q? Well, we use the Pythagorean theorem, right? How far over do I have to go from E to Q and then how far up? I'm finding the legs of those right triangle right here, squaring them, and then square rooting it to give me the hypotenuse. It's the Pythagorean theorem. So I'm going to say the distance from E to Q is the square root, because we're solving for this hypotenuse. We're taking the square root of the squares of the legs of this bottom leg. 2 to 6 is a distance of 4. And I'm squaring it. I don't really care about if I'm doing 2 minus 6 or 6 minus 2. Right? 2 minus 6 and 6 minus 2 are both 4 or negative 4. And I'm squaring it. so that'll take care of it, right? And I'll show you what I mean in the next one. Over here, if I go from 5 down to 1, it's a distance of 4, right? So 5 minus 1 or 1 minus 5, you either get 4 or negative 4. But if you square both of them, you still get 16. So I'm not worried about that. OK, erase this. OK, so that means the distance is 16 plus 16, 32, and the square root of that. All right, well, the distance from Q to our points, A and B, has to also be the square root of 32, right? So if I want all the points that are the same distance uh, from Q, this distance, I'm saying I want square root of 32 to equal the distance between some mystery point. Let's say, um, I don't, I'm not going to call it A, I'm just going to call it X and Y, right? So the distance between, let's say, Q and some mystery point. I'll call it question mark. The, that point has some x value and some y value. And it's probably better to write x1, y1, but that's just a little bit too messy for me. So, but the point is, no pun intended, the distance from q to this mysterious point, x and y, has to follow this distance formula. So we do x, the mysterious point, minus the x value of q, which is 6. That's squared. That's our, that's our, that's our, that's our distance, any point here on the x-axis from Q plus um, the y value of this mystery point minus the y value of Q. Boom. This is our second useful equation. Now you might be asking, why is that useful? Well, let's start to break it down. Let's square both sides. Square the left-hand side, we get just 32, right? The square root and squaring cancel out. Same is true on the right. We're going to get x minus 6 squared plus y minus 5 squared. But two variables here that we can't solve for them exactly. Um, it is important to note, though, before we go any further, look at the equation of a circle. Notice that 
Um, this measurement, 32, is the radius squared of that circle. The radius is the square root of 32. Notice that 6 and 5 are the center, uh, the values 6 and 5 here for q, which is the center of our circle. And that will always be true. And we'll go over that more in detail. I just want to introduce that. The circle formula, so amazingly, is based on the distance formula of the Pythagorean theorem. And that makes a little bit of sense. If you think about it, right, let's go back to our image here. Um, this circle around q is a collection of all the points. Let's zoom out a tiny bit. On this circle here, all these points are the same distance from the center, q. So we can write the equation of a circle as a set distance, in this case a square root of 32, from q. All the points that have that distance from q would form a circle. And then, as you might guess, in 3D, that would be a sphere, right? How cool is that? All right, so but back to the coolness here of the algebra. Um, before I do y minus 5, I also want to connect this constraint over here. Because it has to be on the perpendicular bisector, y has to equal negative x plus 7. Plug it in. y is negative x plus 7, and then we're going to subtract 5. So we'll deal with that. We have x minus 6 squared, and we're almost done, believe it or not. And that is 32. Okay, so x minus 6 squared is x squared minus 12x plus 36. And I did a quick distribution there, x minus 6 times x minus 6. Over here, this is going to be negative x, and then plus 7 minus 5 is plus 2. We're squaring that. So we get x squared still minus 12x plus 36. Negative x times negative x is x squared. Negative x times 2, and then another negative x times 2 because you're distributing, right? You've got negative x plus 2 times negative x plus 2. So we just did this combination, negative x times negative x is x squared. Negative x times 2, and another negative x times 2 is negative 4x. And then finally, plus 4. That equals 32. Now I start simplifying. We've got an x squared and an x squared. That's 2x squared. We've got negative 12x and negative 4x. That's negative 16x. 36 plus 4 is 40, but then minus this 32. That gets a 0 over here. So 36 plus 4 is 40. Minus 32 is 8. And we can solve it from here, but I'm going to make my life easier. Divide everything by 2. That won't change the answers. That connects to uh, dilations of roots. But for now, I'll just say it doesn't does not change the answer. We gotta solve for x, so we're gonna use the quadratic formula. x equals negative b, this is b, right? Plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So in this quadratic, a is 1, it's the coefficient of x squared. b is negative 8, the coefficient of x, and c is 4, the constant at the end. Just plug it in. The negative b is the opposite of b, so we're given negative 8, so it's gonna be plus 8 plus or minus the square root of b squared is 64 minus 4 times ac. So 4 times 1 times 4 is 16, all over 2 times a, and a is 1, so 2. Now this looks really nasty, but watch this. We do 8 plus or minus the square root of 48, right? 64 minus 16 is 48, divided by 2. We have to divide both 8 and this by 2. So what I would say is do 8 divided by 2, that's 4. But then for the square root of 48, I'm going to divide it by 2, but I'm going to write it at 2 as the square root of 4. Same thing, right? Square root of 4 is 2. The reason I write it this way is because you can actually divide square roots directly. 48 divided by 4, those square roots divided, is the same thing as the square root of 12, right? 4 times 12 is 48. How cool is that? And then we break down um, 12, 4 plus or minus the square root of 4 times the square root of 3, that's 12, right? 4 times 3 is 12. And the square root of 4 is 2. So we have 4 plus or minus 2 root 3. This is the x values of our two points. Let's go back up here to this mess. So we have one point here and one point here. And I, I don't have enough room. I'll just I'll write it down here. Um, the one of the points is 4 plus 2 root 3 and the x value. The other point has a value of 4 minus 2 root 3. So I'm going to say that I think this is point B and this is point A. All right, so then what about the y value? So we had an equation earlier up here. Uh, y equals negative x plus 7. Let's use that, and then, oh my gosh, we're done. y equals negative x plus 7. So the opposite of x plus 7. So the opposite of this, negative 4 plus 2 root 3 plus 7. That's our first y value. And the second one is the opposite of this, 4 minus 2 root 3 plus 7. Okay, <laughs> what does that equal? Okay, let's, let's go right over here. So the x values are the same. 
these two first values, 4 plus 2 root 3. And the second one is still 4 minus 2 root 3, but we can simplify the y values a little bit. Negative 4 plus 7, that's 3. And then negative 2 root 3 is still there. Can't combine that any further. Negative 4 plus a 7 again is still 3. And then a negative, negative 2 root 3 is plus 2 root 3. These are the exact values and locations of A and B. Um, Amazing, right? We, we can find the exact locations, not approximate decimals, using algebra, and that supports what we saw here in the geometry. It's such a cool problem. It's got so much to it. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, feel free to follow up and ask me questions. Thank you.